meantime, I'll talk about. So, as far as companion plants for cacti and succulents, there's really probably more than two schools of thought, but there's two general schools of thought. And one is that you want your cactus and succulents to be grown like sculptures in a garden. And in that case, you don't want them surrounded by other plants. So they're growing individually so that you can see, you know, the munificence of each plant individually. But another school of thought is, is you want things to be grown more naturally. And in natural case, it's very seldom. You've been watching plants in nature all weekend, and very seldom are they growing isolated. They're almost always with other plants. And so myself, I'm of the second school. But um, if you're of the first, there's nothing wrong with that either. As long as your plants are happy and doing well, it really doesn't matter how you decide to do it. We had a September issue of the Cactus Journal, and I had done uh, this, um, this talk several times in Denver, and I was really pleased to see that, that the landscaping issue covered this. And the, the experts in other parts of the country, and especially in the Southwest, came up with the same conclusions that I did of why companion plants might be valuable in a garden. And we'll go through and look at these, but as I said, nature very seldom has just a cactus or a succulent growing by itself. But they also provide protection to our plants by providing shade and also moderating soil and air temperatures, which as I talked about on Friday with the uh, microclimates can make a huge difference in an arid climate particularly. They remove excess water from the soil, especially the shrubs. They enhance seasonality, as we'll see. They add color and drama. And they soften prickly demeanors. We're all these people in this group, well, for the most part, we all like things that have thorns. Somebody said to me, you know, I, I, I only grow succulents, I don't like the thorny things. And I said, oh, not me. If a tree has a thorn on it, that's the one I want to use. I like things that are armed. And so it, it helps by having a mix of plants to, to soften that and make it more approachable to people who are unlike us. And I think it shows very clearly here this is a new garden, and I don't know if my friend Bill Adams ever did add some other plants to it, but to me, that's just crying out for something else to be in there. Our cactus bloom for a very brief time, and then there, and I love the shapes. I would not care a bit if they ever bloomed, but still, some flowers would add something to that for most people, and you're seeing Don Barnett's garden on the right, and he has almost strictly a cactus garden, but he allows wildflowers in there as well. And you can see the effect. And that is one of the gardens that we should have open if, we're, if we do this in a few years in our area. So looking to, for, for a cactus that grow in areas that get harsh winters and um, hot summers, these are the two main environments they grow in. And the prairie, Pawnee Buttes, is a protected grassland in Colorado. And this is our cactus club going out there to look and see what's there. And this is a golf course near my home where they decided that when they were putting that in, they would protect the natural prairie. Because they're just like everywhere else they're building out onto our prairie. It's not just happening in Mexico, it's happening in Colorado and probably where you live as well, where all the wild areas are being built on. And we find um, many different types of cactus and succulents, um, primarily the cactus and yuccas growing in these areas naturally. This is Denver Botanic Gardens Prairie Garden, where they've replicated that and concentrated it. So this isn't a natural prairie, this is a prairie where they've taken prairie across the state and it's, so it's mostly a short grass prairie but there are some of the tall grass plants in there as well and there's quite a few uh, cactus and succulents, it's the choya imbricata on the upper right that are also mixed in there and the yucca glauca which is the native one to the Denver area on the upper left. 
The other area that we look to for plants are the canyons, the cold canyons, the cold dry deserts. And here we find quite a few plants as well, like the sclerocactus par par parviflorus that you see in the center. And um, this is a kind of serious here, blooming in Colorado National Monument. This is Zion. Zion's just kind of getting out of our range, but that's a plant we can grow in Denver as well. So that's another area that we look to, the canyons and the, pine, the uh, pine juniper woodlands and shrublands, and also uh, in the mountain areas, just, just into Montaigne, because we do have cactus grow up to, I think, 11,000 feet in the Rocky Mountains. Pediocactus simpsonii is found um, at least at 10,000 feet. And this is the Barnett's Garden. You saw that on the first slide, but this was this spring when we had, we had an extremely dry winter, but we had concentrated rains this spring, and that's what resulted from it. And um, wow, it could hardly be more spectacular. You're seeing a few cactus blooming in there, but mostly you're seeing the wildflowers. Well, so shrubs. I'm not going to talk a lot, a lot about different types of shrubs, but xeric shrubs, particularly, they have huge root systems. They go very, very deep into the soil to delve moisture, and some of these will go 100 feet around away from the shrub to get moisture that falls. And most cactus have very shallow root systems. And things like our yuccas, they have a, a like a carrot. It's a very large carrot um, root. So, so they're sharing the same soil, but different levels of it. And I think this is a, a good example. This is a very, very large garden down in Pueblo. Um, and you can see how the shrubs are in there with the, the large cactus. What they do is they're pulling any excess moisture out of the soil. And this is what, ha what happens with us, is we actually have less rainfall than Tucson as a general in a normal year. But our rain is spread out throughout the year. We're a continental climate, so we tend to have a heavy snow air, um, precipitation in April, March, April. Then we end up with rains sometimes in May and June, as we did this year. Your monsoons come up to us, and apparently they're there in Colorado this week. And then we also tend to have very heavy snowfalls in October. So you can see we get moisture year round, and these shrubs are actually taking and using this moisture, um, putting it back in the air through evapotranspiration, and I can't even talk, but um, yes. <laughs> and um, so they're removing excess moisture from the soil, which can be a problem with our kind of steady, more steady periods of rainfall throughout the season. We also can have snow for eight months of the year, and I have had at my house. I live just 15 miles south of Denver, and I have had snow in June, and the heaviest, some of the heaviest snowfalls I've had have been in September. So obviously, the cactus that are adapted to our region have found ways to do that, and they, they shrivel. They, have, uh, they form a, a type of like um, antifreeze, and so that protects the cells from freezing if they stay plump and full of water. So you'll notice this is in my garden. That's a sculpture. That's the real Apuncha down here. And you can see how it's kind of shriveled. And so we're not looking at anything real attractive for much of the year. And so you don't, unless you want to have your garden completely filled with sculptural representations of your plants, this will actually give you, um, though I think there's nothing more attractive than, I, I consider the imbricata like a Christmas tree because all of its branches grow, go down and it's about my height. It's really a beautiful plant and it's decorated with its fruit. So you don't have to go pull up the ball cactus and put them on there, like we saw in one of our earlier talks. So, we get really beautiful plants in winter by going to other continents and other parts of the country. Some of my favorites are the bulbs, that, the continental bulbs from Central Asia that bloom extremely early, like the Iris reticulata. 
there are more and more of those available now. I think um, yuccas are good because yuccas don't do that, that shrinking and, and um, shriveling thing, but they do look just gorgeous with the frost on them, as you see here. This is Denver Botanic Gardens, and you can see how beautiful the um, perennials that have been left there, their foliage, their tops are dead. We clean them up usually not until about March, and the same with these grasses and seed heads all mixed in here together. Oh, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong, so how do I get back? I hit the, okay, I'll go ahead while he fixes that. So we get a lot of things that come very early for us. Um, between snowfalls, we'll generally have quite a number of wildflowers in starting in January. It's always really surprising for conventional gardeners in, in Denver to find out that we have much more color in our xeric gardens because these are plants that if they're too wet, they just rot and die. The bulbs want to be dry during the summer and um, we can provide that. And so you're seeing tulips. Tulips for us are extremely perennial and also wildflowers from Europe as well. So I just wanted to show you, this is Denver Botanic Gardens again. For those of you who didn't see, I had some pictures of the same border on um, Friday. The Watersmart Garden in early June is just absolutely stunning. And it's watered 16 times a year. Summer is a little quieter, but you still have a lot going on. This is Dryland Mesa. This is where a lot of the cactus collections and are kept at Denver Botanic Gardens. This is my house, that's that same sculpture showing that same view, um, probably in June or mid-June. And then as we go through the summer, some of our best flowers, our, our best wildflowers bloom because they need the moisture to get going. So some of these larger flowers had just started blooming when we left home last week, and a lot of these will bloom now until our first hard frost or snowfall. These are all annuals or biennials and some of the most beautiful flowers that we grow. These are all big ones. And until we started doing more and more with Zurich Gardens, the only place you saw those was along freeways. You know, we looked at, at Brazil and why aren't we using those flowers? We're just as guilty, are those trees? We're just as guilty of that in um, most of where the places we live. We don't look around us and use what's there. So autumn is another season that we can do very well. I, I like to try to have flowers at home and the Botanic Gardens does a good job of it as well for at least 10 months of the year. And when we get together at a meeting, in um, December, we always ask, what have you got in bloom? Because that's a real point of pride to have something in bloom in December and January when our average temperature is probably around 30 degrees in daytime. And then we have color and drama. And I think when you play these bright, bright colors, uh, this was especially nice. The buds on this opuntia were exactly the same color as on the Sprousia, the globe mallow. Um, I love this oriental poppy. These are, neither of these are in my gardens. Um, other people have had some really nice ideas. Again, these are at Denver Botanic Gardens, another the globe mallow that you're familiar with, Ambigua, and also hummingbird mints. In the last 10 years, hummingbird mints have really taken the whole horticulture world by storm. And um, I just love this leather and lace thing that goes on with these plants, because you've got the prickly plant and then you've got this gorgeous soft flower in front of it. Compatibility issues, it's pretty surprising. Scott Calhoun, some of you probably know him from Tucson, and he visited us. This is Dear Bolander's house, which I showed you quite a few pictures of on Friday. And that is a dwarf purple peach growing right by this tall okuncha and this trunked yucca. And he about flipped. I mean, first of all, he wondered why we would do this. But second of all, he wondered how you would do this. 
But this is microclimates, and so that I'm guessing how he managed that was that plant is about four feet away. You you know you get foreshortening in pictures, and he probably put it in a little bit of an indentation. It's also possible that dwarf peach needs a whole less less water than we think it does. But then Kelly Grumman's at his home also has a fern leaf peony growing next to a trunked yucca. I um, believe that's rostrata. But wondering how that could happen. Well, I looked up the origins of the fern leaf peony, and it's from the Mongolian steppes. So they're really not so different where these two plants come from. So we're kind of making a compromise. And Dan Johnson, I mean, I was just looking through my slides to find things for this talk. And at Denver Botanic Gardens, this is the same garden in two different years. I don't know how he decided to put zinnias next to yucca rostrata, but there they are in all their glory. I suppose if you couldn't do it any other way, you could do it in a pot. But these are not in a pot. And then another year, there's dahlias growing in there. So who would have ever thunk? I mean, you have to try things out to find out what will work because what you don't want to do is water those so much that you're hurting your yucca. So insider tip, when you're doing, um, when you're choosing plants, put your mesic, the water-loving selections, put those next to where water is, or if you have a hillside, put it at the bottom of a hillside, or put it in a swale any place that holds a little bit of extra water. It can be close to things that are quite xeric, and then you get these weird juxtapositions. This is a hibiscus growing again in a, what it was, this is the same garden here. Um, I wouldn't imagine how that could grow, except he planted it right next to where he has a recirculating stream bed, and it works, because I looked at this nursery display garden and three years of running it was there so it wasn't just plopped in in a temporary thing it was there the whole time so consider size and scale and this is really important because see this little guy right there that is not going to survive that when it grows over the top and i know that for a, a fact because at my house i have killed plants this is deers again and we were there one year then we went back the following year, and you can see how this Arenaria, it was a new plant to us and we didn't know what it would do. And when you buy these rock garden plants, generally it'll say one inch tall, six inch wide. Well, that's probably now four feet wide. So it just kept going laterally, and you can see it's, in, it's going for this Opuncha. It's going to swallow it up. And this Opuncha has been swallowed in this following year, it's still there, but just barely. And I like companion plants, but I don't really want to see the plants completely covering one another either. And this is my house, and this is one of the many mistakes I've made that I can share with you. This is a very nice, kind of serious mahaviensis that was about 18 inches across. I let catmint seed in there. There it is right before it rotted out and died. And this little guy somehow managed to live right about here. So I kept the merubium because that's an unusual plant and moved the cactus, but not in time to save this one. So do be careful what you put next to it. And as I mentioned, you buy a plant and they get, they're telling you how big they think it's going to get. Well, this is Zinnia grandiflora. This is it in the plains of Pueblo. That's probably six inches a tall or wide. It's a, a very much a mound. Here it is at Kendrick Lake Gardens where it's probably five or six feet across. So which one do you put on the label? Well, I can tell you most nursery people go with that. And then you get to kind of be surprised. Um, this in this case works because the Whipley eye can stand up to it. But, um, you can imagine if you put a few, like Coryphantha grows in this area, well, if you stuff this full of Coryphantha, they'd be completely swallowed up by that and probably would not survive that. 
You also will find plants will grow different sizes and different types of soils. So in clay soil and in sand, silty sand, which is what I, this is a friend of mine, hers is 10 feet across, it's convolvulus aciriacus. At my house, it was six inches across, pediocactus, before it died. I mean, it just simply didn't survive, but it stayed considerably smaller for the three years it survived. So your soil type will also have an effect, not just the water, on whether your plants, how big they will get. We, I the aesthetics of placement, I, this really bothers me that these tiny little sneedy eye are back in the back. So, and again, I think that's just way out of scale. They're healthy, they're happy, but I don't think that works very well. Where sometimes a large plant works, this is Apex Garden, and I like the way they have all these little tiny plants, and it has a way of getting kind of twee when you just get too many tiny plants. And I like the way they use the lechuguilla in there. As, because that just kind of softens, or well, not softens really, but it just makes it more dramatic. And there are succulents that are perfectly fine intermixing with other plants. And I think in that case, the sump with, uh, I believe that's uh, salvia um, dagestanica, look very good together. You can also use a borrowed view. I found this garden when I was looking for slides for this talk, and this. This garden is primarily alpines. She brought one uh, choya to the foreground. In the background, you can see that's almost all cactus. This is just another view of the same garden, but I love the way she took that across the road. So you feel like you're looking at one garden, but you're, you really could give these if they needed it a little bit more water, and then not water in here and back here at all, and have that effect in the spring. So the, looking through the cast of characters, this is my garden, um, a garden I don't water on the, um, it's on the north side of my house, but it's open to a field next door. And what I look for is mostly native plants, but I, and so this is primarily native plants. And, but I also use adapted plants. I look to the cold deserts and steppes of North and South America, Central Europe and Asia, Middle East and parts of Africa. And I found things like the Lydia Bloom broom is perfect in this garden, even though it's not a native, but it doesn't need any more water than anything else you're seeing here. So looking at the cast of characters, annual flowers are perfect, especially for new gardens. When you have a new garden, you want to place your cactus and succulents to be the permanent plants. So you want to give them as much room as they will need eventually so that you're not going to have to move them. And I would say not in 100 years, but in 10 years is a reasonable amount to how big is this plant going to get in 10 years. And when you do that, they can be pretty widely spaced. So the deserts do this naturally, but we can use annuals from all over the world and have them fill in either seeding or the gazania, which is a kind of a six-pack nursery annual anything that will grow there and take the same conditions. Biennial flowers complete their lives in two years, and biennials are especially well adapted for the climate that I'm in because biennials are dormant during the season when we're not getting water, and so they're only growing during the times like during winter when we don't get a lot of precipitation, but we have snow on the ground here and there throughout the winter that in the spring or some of them bloom in the fall. Um, cactus lovers love this thing. It's in the status family, but um, there's many, many different types of biennials. This is the flower of that. And after it flowers, it dies, drops its seed. The thing about biennials is once you've got them, they, if they like where they are, they will seed around and come back um, every year. So the thing is, if you want to be able to control the flowers and have them gone after a while, you want things that aren't going to seed around because then you'll have to pull those out. So we also are looking at native perennial flowers like the silky lupin that you see here. And I actually like things woven into a punches or this dryland columbine, um, the little Utah columbine, Scopulorum.
that you see in the deserts of Utah. There are also exotic perennial flowers. There's a perennial gazania that you see here. Um, in here, there's uh, yarrow, Serbian yarrow, and uh, the stonecrest here at Kendrick Lake. Bulbs are wonderful. They are from the same type of, of climate uh, that we have in Central Asia. This is also a continental climate. Why we don't have more bulbs in our area naturally, I don't know, but these are perfectly exquisitely adapted to the region that I live in, and we have lots and lots of choices and more every year in the bulbs. You're seeing early crocus and um, kind of doxa. These were taken at my house in February and March. The grasses, now I can understand why somebody looks at grasses and says, why would I want a grass in my cactus? Because they're your worst weeds. But this is a, at Denver Botanic Gardens where they've allowed our native foxtail barley to grow, and also the California poppies to grow into the Apuncha. And if that was mine, I would just leave it. But if you're having trouble with grasses, the long hemostats, I found, and the long tweezers do a really good job of pulling the grasses out. So you don't have to do that. Of course, the best thing is don't let them get in there in the first place. If that's not your idea of attractive, then just don't, you don't want to do that. Sheep's fescue is a small grass native, and the Mexican feather grass is one of the most beautiful of our grasses. I know it can be weedy for you in other climates, but it's barely on the edge of hardiness for us. We also have a few evergreen shrubs. These are um, Oregon's creeping grape. You might not think of that as being xeric, but it's quite xeric. We have some of the um, cold hardy manzanitas that we're using, and the ericamarias, all the different types of rabbit brush. We have dwarf conifers as well, as you see here. The, the thing about um, shrubs is there's hundreds of them. And so you're only seeing just a few examples. Now we're going to look at, if you've got small cactus, if you're growing rock garden style, things that you might want to use. And I put just some examples of some of the small things that we grow. And then we'll talk about plants that might be safe to use with these. Cushions, mats, and buns, I talked about that just briefly the other day. These are dry land plants that grow on what we, um, on this dry step, and we sometimes call this dry land tundra because the plants look very similar to what you find in the alpine areas, but these are extremely dry areas. Those plants are good choices for us, whether they come from North America or a lot of times from the steppes of Asia. Also, I wanted to warn you that there can be very similar plants that are different sizes. So these are both Hymenoxus, but this little guy, Acolis, is, can be, I've seen Acolis that are only two inches tall that come from Pikes Peak. And then the thrift leaf, Perky Sue, they look very similar, but this one gets about 15 inches. So for the small ones, you'll want to look for the small version of the plant. So some of the, um, I'm going to just go through and show you some of the, um, we, we lost a lot of time at the beginning, so I'm going to go through fairly fast. I just wanted you to get an idea how pretty this can be. So these are some of the things that look good with small cactus and succulents and will not eat them alive. So Spanish draba blooms in um, January and February, which makes it particularly valuable. The cutleaf daisies, one of our natives, as is the creeping golden aster. And then the helichrysum is actually from South Africa, but this is one that's only about an inch tall. It's more wide spreading. Penstemons are especially the really small ones. Some of these can be really hard to grow. Um, they're perfect growing in, because these are a lot of them found in desert areas, true deserts. Uh, are very good with cactus and succulents. So some examples here. Nail wart is a fun one. This is in full bloom as you see it. It's probably a half an inch tall and it just kind of spreads um, laterally. Phlox, uh, some, they're all natives to the United States, but the western natives are going to be your best choices for a xeric garden. 
Santa Fe Phlox is awfully hard to acquire, but it's a really beautiful one that actually prefers a little bit of shade. Um, I also grow uh, Gray Eye California Phlox. This is at, in my garden. And then I, this is also at my house, Rose Cushion. The Gossi Iris sent me the real small phloxes. And I grow every single little native phlox I can get my hands on. Some of them full grown are two inches tall, three inches wide. And in the, early, in the spring, they just cover themselves with flowers. We also have front range twin pod, which is rare in our region and protected, but fortunately it got into gardens before it was listed. Uh, Devil's Gate Twin Pod is a white flowered uh, Physeria, and we also have the purple ground cherry, which can get big if it's watered, but it'll stay uh, quite a uh, nice scale if it's not. The Easter daisies are wonderful because they bloom in March. They do that in the wild too, so frequently we miss these because there's still snow on the ground and these melt. The snow melts and these just pop into bloom and it can be real difficult to get where they are to see them. But they bloom by succession, so areas where snow stays on the ground later, you'll find them later and later in the year. So a friend of mine in the foothills this year where we had snow stay pretty late called and said, they're in bloom and I think that was May. Insider tip, aggressive sedums can really be a problem. And I don't know how many of you grow acre or album, but um, I dug them all out and threw them over the fence, so now they're growing in the field next to my house. And then as my garden got, and the climate's been getting drier and drier in Denver, I decided I wanted acre back, and now it refuses to grow for me. So, you know, it got mad apparently. Cool season annuals, these are the desert annuals, um, are good choices for spring colors. These are things that naturally would grow between the large plants in the deserts, and we just sprinkle them on the ground between our plants, and they'll come up on spring moisture. But you can also use, like I said, the, the things that you might consider more six-pack annuals for later color, because the desert annuals cannot stand any heat at all, none. And so they're gone the minute we're hot. And we were in the hundreds in May, so that meant we had a pretty short season for them this year. But there are also some heat-loving annuals as well that you can use that these will continue blooming for us um, throughout the summer. They're not frost tolerant, so it tends to be one or the other. They're either, sh they're either cool season, frost tolerant, or they can be heat tolerant and no, they can't stand any frost at all, so we lose them when it freezes. And then some of these tiny little bulbs that look very good with cactus and succulents. And then again with the, like the sedums, you've got to be, this is my house. I did not know that at the time that some of the tulips are rhizonymous and they have spread and they have, and some of these like the Iphion are just offsetting, but suddenly they've just smothered out everything else in that garden and I've had to change. These were small plants growing in there, but no more. Star of Persia, five bucks a bulb. I think I bought five of them originally and now I have, I guess, what do you think, Randy? 8,000 of them? <laughs> I spend, anytime I have time, I'm on my hands and knees digging those things out and throwing them over the fence. Um, they, foliage can also do damage, so you want very early bulbs that the foliage is small and dies out because this is, this is actually the fall blooming crocuses and that too has smothered out a lot of plants. So we're going to look at, we'll go fast through companions for large cactus and succulents because this is actually easier. It's just a matter of scale. They can withstand almost anything you desire to put with them. So again, um, the insider tip this time is you can use aggressive self-sowers with these plants because they're not going to, they're not, there's no way the California poppy's going to smother that agave, which is probably 18 inches across, or the larkspur that you see on the top is safe with the opuncha. Perennial flowers, there's quite a few uh, natives like the abronia fragrance, this one, the snowball fragrance, that's 
That's similar to the pink uh, bronia that you have in the southwest, but this one is fully perennial if it likes where it's growing. And it's um, very, very fragrant as its name suggests. But we also have non-natives like just plain Achillea moonshine. It's at every single Home Depot in town. And that works very well in Zurich Gardens. It stays quite a bit more compact. Or the prickly, um, the acanthalimums are the prickly thrifts. This is them in bloom in Dare's garden. I promise you, you cactus lovers, you'll love these things. They are the nastiest plant known to man. It is a pincushion. They don't have blockheads, but they just leave you absolutely bloody when you try to get the seed heads off of those. But, but they are very, very pretty, and I like prickly plants. So we have Agastachys, as I mentioned before. We have some odd things like Allosoides, um, the Greek bladder pod. Hardy snapdragons, they're being bred in our area from some of the alpine snapdragons. So you get a more of a cross with the ones that you see everywhere. And asters, uh, aster dream of beauties from North Dakota. So of course it's perfectly hardy. Fenlari at my garden, and chocolate flower here at Kendrick Lake, which really does smell like chocolate. And I've seen that at Phoenix Botanic Garden, so I know you can grow that well. Red valerian is just, a, people think of it just as a weed, but the more xeric your garden, the more you start to like those things that other people think of as weeds, because they grow and prosper. That is the red valerian right here. And that's the same garden where you saw the dahlias and the zinnias. Just a really pretty garden. Castilea, if you can get them to grow, they're very difficult to grow in gardens for us. Prairie clovers, another of our natives in our area. Um, Dianthus, these are, these are not natives. Europe, um, look how good they look in a Zurich garden. Uh, Grecian foxglove, sunset foxglove is here. And the twin spurs, most diasha are not hardy. But um, this is one that they've chosen for plant select because it turned out to be hardy in our region and comes back year after year. Some more of our native areogonums, we, Randy's, um, what are you in the areogonum society? Treasure. Treasure, so I have to push a lot of areogonums, so that's why you're seeing three of those. Sea holly, another plant I can't believe cactus lovers wouldn't just love because it, it's, it's got that same prickly, uh, the meter we like. Red horned poppies here, and red rock rose here. Bush morning glory, I will take one minute to tell you about that plant. That has a root, they call it man underground. It um, grows near my house. The root weighs 150 pounds. And I've been looking at all these codex plants this whole weekend thinking, hey, I wonder if we could expose the neck of this root and get our own hardy plant. So, got to try that. Tall bearded iris, here they are at Dan Johnson's garden. This is also Dan Johnson's garden with red hot poker. We have English lavender does very well for us, even though we're zone four or five, but it turns out what lavender needs is to be dry in the winter, and our winters, our winters are not wet. And people think they are because they're skiing, but that's up in the mountains. We're down in the rain shadow, and our snow contains very little water, hence we have powder in our snow. But um, that's perfect because the English lavender not only survives, it reproduces by seedlings where we are. And they just opened a big lavender garden at Denver Botanic Gardens. This is a, a relative of the status we saw earlier, it's a large purple status. Uh, the flax, this is a golden flax, and this is the blue flax. This one more or less stays put, and this one is the one you all know seeds around on roadsides. Merubiums, we saw merubium earlier. The bees just love that. Blackfoot daisy, this is another one that's wild in our area. Um, Anothra is, is a little bit east of us. The cespitosa lives near us and Modernella is introduced and um, just gorgeous in gardens. It's a red form of Modernella. 
The ornamental oreganos are perfect, as our, you saw earlier an oriental poppy, but I wanted to show you a different color form of that. Again, penstemons, these are taller penstemons. Penstemons are almost always dry-loving plants and do very, very well for us and tend to be longer-lived when they grow in a xeric garden. Cashmere sage, this is an, at Denver Botanic Gardens, this is another big sage, uh, Central Asian, and the Cape fuchsia here um, does very well for us as well, which you might think of that as more of a pot plant, but that one's growing in the ground. Uh, Yugoslavian sage, we saw this earlier, here it is in bloom. It was the silver foliage that was, I think it was wrapping around a stem. Uh, many, many sages. Sages, like penstemons, really love xeric conditions. And then the sedums, and there's so many new sedums. Um, I've just been adding more and more of them every year. Santalina is a wonderful plant to have in your garden because unlike you, we have mosquitoes. And if you rub this on your skin, mosquitoes don't like it. Um, it's a repellent and rock soapwort. Snow daisy and princess plume, you can see it growing here. This is in uh, Grand Junction, and Don, I don't know if you're in the audience, but he's, I talked to him about his flowers, and he said they're all going. He likes his more sculptural. He doesn't want the wildflowers in there, so he's getting rid of them. But um, if you like them, this is an excellent one right here. Giant silver mullion. We think of mullions as leaves. This is a biennial that is particularly attractive and is not weedy. And with the drought we had this spring, they're usually, this, those bloom stalks are five or six feet tall. And one, I noticed one in my house started blooming the other day, and it's probably topping out at 15 inches. So the drought has very much affected its size. Verbena, um, and the hummingbird trumpet, I, I know you have those. We were amazed to find that these are all hardy because they're from California, and they, they're not necessarily growing in places that get a lot of winter. But we somebody tried one, and it survives minus 30 at my house, minus 30 Fahrenheit. So it's actually a really, really tough plant. Annual flowers, um, just a few examples. Aggressive bulbs. So you can even grow things like grape hyacinths that gardeners absolutely despise with large succulents. The large tulips do well too. Tulips have an origin of dry summers. Foxtail lilies, they're just magnificent at Denver Botanic Gardens. They're also called desert lilies. Shrubs and small trees, as I said, we won't talk too much about those. I'm on red, so I'm going really fast. But um, desert willows, grow in the proper microclimates, not at my house, but Equisetina, or excuse me, um, Ephedra Equisetina grows at my house. The Bird of Paradise won't grow at mine either, but the, because I'm just uh, about 800 feet higher in elevation than Denver. So this is um, my next to last slide. I just wanted to show you Dan Johnson's home again, where he is growing a mix of things. And then this, is the issue that came out right after I start, I had agreed to do this talk, and a lot of what I've talked about is in this issue. It was just outstanding. And I was going to, um, I grow every single plant that's in that picture in a pot. And most of them are at least 10 years old, so they're pretty good size. And we were planning to take that and arrange it and make a picture to copy it but I broke my foot this spring. So that did not happen. <laughs> so you'll just have to imagine our version of that. But uh, I want to thank you all again. This has just been a wonderful experience for us. We have enjoyed ourselves so much in seeing some of the gardens and, and hearing all the wonderful talks. This has been a really amazing convention. So thank you for doing it.